All right, everybody, and welcome back. Welcome to Theory Underground. I am the host, David McCarricker, and today we are joined by Chris Catrone. Welcome. Hi. How's Hello. it going? How are you? Good. Good. Um, well, okay, this is awkward. I'm calling it off. Um, no, just kidding. So, everybody, look, Chris has been here before. I, I can't act like this is our first conversation. We've had multiple conversations at length, and sometimes uh, we've disagreed quite, quite, uh, quite a lot in the same sense mm -hmm. that Daniel Tutt is very over this post-Marxist, post-structuralist, kind of post-1968 France theory thing. Um, uh, and I'm obviously not, but I do believe that there are things that we need to learn from uh, our betters, from our elders, from people who've been in the, the, this milieu a lot longer than we have. And I might disagree with you today and, dis and agree with you in a year from now, in five years from now. In, and I don't know. I really couldn't say. But uh, for anybody who's not familiar with Chris, let me pull up on the screen here something. Chris, you won't be able to see it, but you don't need to. Don't worry about it. Basically, I'm just going to okay. show where people can access our past conversations, which are currently unlisted, which means that they're not being advertised to the general public. I plan on eventually re-releasing most Theory Plebe content uh, once it's been sort of rebranded. But if you scroll down on the main page, there is a playlist called Plebe Get Schooled. And if you click on that, there's a whole series here of various conversations that I've had with Nancy Fraser, with Dr. Ian Thompson, with uh, Peter Rollins, uh, with uh, more Thompson, with Andrew McLuhan, with Gerald Smith, uh, who's a sort of Trotskyist who lives in the in the Oakland area. You're probably familiar with who that is, right? Yep. Right, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. This is a th that's that video right there is four hours and forty seven minutes, and it's basically uh, five separate talks all put into one. Uh, U.S. political prisoners, um, black nationalism. Antifa in the United Front, Black Lives Matter, questions and answers. And basically, he's against all of the standard leftist positions on these things from a principled position. And I think it's totally worth listening to. Uh, this is where you'll also find the past conversations with Dr. Christine Luidi Soli. But where we really got together the first time, you and I, was to talk about the left is dead versus the left must be killed. Chris Catrone. Right. <laughs> yeah. You versus Benedict Cryptofash. Could you like, right. could you, and then, and then after that conversation, we had another one, which was like, what, why, and how Lenin plus Adorno? Um, yes. Like, how are you into Lenin and Adorno? And uh, the, the, then event, that's where you said some controversial things about theory. And then we brought on McGowan to respond. And we right. still haven't had the great, you know, conversation between you two that we hope to someday have. But uh, yeah. today, today McGowan doesn't have the time. But look, People who may have watched all that might have forgotten, or we've got a lot of new people, and they just need to know. You are the founder and key organizer of Platypus Affiliated Society, whose motto is "The Left is Dead, Long Live the Left." the 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 platypus idea is because Engels had a meltdown at the idea that platypuses were real <laughs> because it didn't fit his evolutionary model. And then eventually he was humbled by reality. And your point is that Marxism can grow and adapt. And so the left can come back if it ever grows and adapts. And that you believe that there are essential elements and threads throughout every aspect of the left that have to be sublated uh, into some kind of a new uh, movement. And um, so with that said, that's my introduction to you, but I'd like you to say a few words of introduction yourself with what, what's been going on for you recently. I, I understand the convention just happened. How was the convention? And just what have you been up to? What's going on? Cool. Um, all right. So I'm no longer like the lead organizer of Platypus. Um, what? I passed that baton uh, some years ago now. And so I was, oh. um, you know, the kind of original kind of uh, pedagogue teacher, you know, it was mostly my students who started Platypus. Um, and then I, you know, had a kind of organizational leadership role uh, over the course of the first 10 years. Um, but in more recent years, I've uh, basically been able to step back from that 
and the organization has been able to run itself and continue to grow, which is good, which is very grateful, uh, you know, uh, development for me. Now, um, in terms of like my own background, so that was what I would say my millennial students getting me back involved in the left after I had taken quite a hiatus and sojourn from the left uh, starting in the early 1990s. I wasn't completely detached from the left. I still was a little bit on the edges of like Adolf Reed's um, Labor Party project because he was an important teacher of mine. Um, and he was here in Chicago when I was here in Chicago as well. And so uh, I wasn't, you know, entirely absent from the left, but I definitely had stepped back from my earlier days in high school and college when I was very much involved in activism. Um, and so, you know, I've had a kind of a second life on the left, and that's been through Platypus. Okay. You know, and so, uh, you know, Platypus, I mean, I would say also the question of Marxism, you know, that Marxism is a historical artifact at this point. And uh, in the way that Platypus the animal might, in evolutionary terms, be seen as like a living fossil, you know, meaning it's like a kind of ancient animal that continues to survive and that survives despite subsequent natural history, you know, and so that's why it's sort of between, you know, the, the reptiles, the birds and the mammals. Right. Right. Um, you know, because it's, it's ancient. And so Marxism's like that. And so uh, I do think that like a further development has to take place. But I also think that a history has to be remembered and recovered. And in a critical way. In other words, that the, that the past can critique the present. Right? That it's not just about sticking to an old tradition. But rather, what does that old tradition have to say to the present? in a critical way, rather than assuming that we've somehow made progress mm. over that history. In other words, there might be um, tasks that were recognized in the past that are still with us, you know, capitalism, overcoming capitalism, right? Um, and that the consciousness of that might have been better in the past than it is today which doesn't mean that we just adopt that past consciousness, but at the very least we keep that past original critical consciousness about capitalism and about politics and society, keep that in mind in thinking about how we might move forward and not just accept the historical progress that has taken place in the last hundred years because maybe it hasn't been progress. Right. right. Maybe we haven't really progressed in our consciousness of things. Um, so there's a, you know, a phrase from Adorno, the theorist who tries to um, intervene in practical controversies nowadays finds to his embarrassment that everything he wants to say has been said already and better the first time around. Right. <laughs> right. In right. other words, it's just, you know, how can we check ourselves? And, and again, not, not take on board things that have transpired historically in the meantime, developments that have occurred, um, that it may not have been good developments historically, right? So, um, you know, that's really been what's driving Platypus, um, is that sense, and also the sense that the left as it exists today is also a relic of the past. Right. Right. right of the seventies, <laughs> like like right. <clears throat> when I <clears throat> when I was coming out of my seven years of Bernie activism and uh, you know twenty twenty, it all crashed in twenty twenty, and I was on quarantine in Hawaii, and uh, I I I, that I finally read or I listened to Todd Gitlin's little book. I know it's I know that mm -hmm. like people have all these problems with Gitlin for various reasons that. To me, miss the sure. basic point that is he wrote right. one of the he wrote one of the most beautiful books about the sixties. You might disagree with his points, but he he wrote a beautiful book that gives you a real sort of on the ground feel for what it was like in the sixties. And the the part like two thirds or three fourths into that book where he starts talking about the 
the contradictions that people kept thinking would go away through some dialectical synthesis of revolution right. came to the fore and and people were burning out and getting getting called levers and so i read about the burnout period at the same time that i was burning out right. and and I realized, oh my god, all these people who think that they're saying original things are just fucking echoing this moment, but at least it had a basis at the time. Like, th at least at the time, there was a reason to think that th these forms of anti-imperialist struggle might have some kind of hope to them or something like that. But now people have this ahistorical, presentist approach to things. And so for me, that was a really big factor was reading that. And so you were involved in politics, though, in your, as you say, your student years. Was that in the 70s? 80s. So I'm 80s. not that old, right? Okay. So in the 80s, I was active a bit in high school and then more so in college in the late 80s and early 90s. Okay. Um, and so uh, it was definitely in the shadow of the new left. Uh, you know, that was there and, and a lot of the you know, the, the adult activists I encountered were veterans of the new left from the 60s and 70s. Um, and, you know, so I mentioned like Adolf, who I met later when I was in college. Um, but, you know, certainly at the demos at the gay community center in Manhattan, in Greenwich Village, you know, the older people were all veteran 60s and 70s activists. Uh, my professors in college were all veterans of the 60s and 70s new left activism. Um, one of my professors was the editor of the journal that had been started by the Students for a Democratic Society, the STS. It was called Radical America. It was still carrying on in the 80s, and she had taken it over uh, as editor. Um, so the 60s were very present. Um, you know, I met, I just happened to run into, I didn't really meet um, but I had an encounter with Murray Bookchin, the anarchist, who had written his famous criticism of new left, like Maoism, listen, Marxist. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was just, it was there in, in a very present way. That was still the case for the millennial left uh, when Platypus started. Um, you know, there was a new Students for a Democratic Society uh, that came out of the anti-war movement in the War on Terror era. And it had associated with it uh, what was called the MDS, the Movement for a Democratic Society. And those were the old original SDS people who were serving to uh, mentor the new SDS of the millennials. Um, and so I want to make a plug, if I can. Yeah, so I have please. a book that's coming out with Sublation. It's the first volume of two volumes of collected writings that I've done in the era of Platypus. And so the first volume is the more kind of current events and more politically, you know, commentary kind of volume, and that is the death of the millennial left. Um, and, you know, basically charting through the war on terror, the Great Recession, Obama election, Occupy Wall Street, um, up into the Bernie Sanders era and the Trump era, of course. Um, and, you know, just in terms of that experience. Now, of course, getting involved as a mentor, as a teacher of the millennial left, I had hopes for the millennial left. And, uh, you know, I am kind of sad to have to pronounce the death of the millennial left. But I already did that in 2017. So it's like six years ago. It was, you know, the way they responded to Trump and also just the DSA turn in general and the folding back into the Democratic Party. Um, now, what does that mean? It means that even though there was an authentic millennial left moment, it didn't try as much as the 60s did. The 60s did try. They tried to do something. Namely, they tried to renew the struggle for socialism. Um, now, I don't think that they that they did quite enough. And I think that they also did some things that were mistaken and kind of effort wasted in the wrong direction, but mm. there was an authentic moment. And, um, you know, when we think about the millennial left, the millennial left kind of inherits all that history. It, it inherits the new left. It also inherits the old left, the thirties left. It, it inherits the whole 20th century, you know, especially because, anti-war activism recalled like Vietnam era stuff 
anti-racism recalls civil rights and black power activism. Um, Me Too, you know, recalls second wave feminism. But the Great Recession recalled the Great Depression, right? Um, and obviously the DSA, um, you know, does have a kind of progressive welfare state kind of politics to it um, that recalls the, the welfare state that came out of the New Deal and also the Great Society in the 60s. So, you know, I'm struck by the fact that that's what socialism seems to mean. It seems to mean the welfare state. It seems to mean the identity politics that comes out of the 60s. And that has deeper roots for sure. So I was watching you um, in, with Christine. And, um, but, you know, really the way we experience identity politics, even though it has much deeper roots, it's really very much affected by the way those things were formulated in the 60s and 70s. And that were totally institutionalized when I was a young person in the 80s and 90s. So when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was around the left, all the things that we experience today from identity politics was there already back then. Like right. progressive stack. Do you know what progressive stack is? Yeah, this so, is where at the DSA know, at the DSA National Convention when to to it, when you're in line, you have to get back in line by orders yeah. of your privilege. And so if if yeah. you're a black woman, you have to get behind the black woman who's in the wheelchair. Yeah. Yes. That was there when I first went to the, you know, the gay community center in Greenwich Village with my friends from high school. And we arrive and, you know, we're like white working class people from the suburbs. And so we're kind of out of place to begin with. Um, but, you know, we encounter progressive stack and it's like, what the hell is this? And the way it was done there wasn't so much a line. It was, you know, a youth meeting. It was, wasn't that many people. It was maybe 30 people. But it meant that um, all the women, all the people of color have to speak before the men and the white people. Like, have to have an opportunity to speak. Um, and so it was, you know, to prevent white men from dominating the discussion, which I guess uh, sometimes happens. Um, but it was mostly, uh, you know, it was New York City. It was mostly people of color at, at that meeting. Um, it was about 50-50 men and women, um, you know, young men, young women. Um, and so it was it was alienating because I felt like it prevented real conversation from happening, real discussion from happening, meaning, you know, it it. it prevented kind of dialogue it just meant that people right. sort of made statements and sort of testified you know uh, to their personal experience but there was no real interaction or engagement made possible by that progressive stack kind of you know it was very strange because you know i was there to like meet other gay people and you know and uh connect with them at a variety of levels but politically you know, really like, you know, have them understand what I was about and understand what they were about. And that just couldn't happen because we were already slotted into these positions. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, even though the DSA claims to be against identity politics, of course, they can't be because they're Democrats. And that is the bread and butter of the Democratic Party. And so you can't you can't really go against that. Um, you can quibble with it. You can criticize it, but you can't actually oppose it. You know, so, so it's 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 hard for me because, you know, I'm an, a middle aged older person now and I feel like, wow, young people are just reliving my own youth and nothing's really progressed. Right. In terms right. of like left culture, um, you know, and in some ways it's gotten worse. Right. It's sad. Right. And so this is this is a good segue into the sort of announcement that I wanted to make. And so really I could take the two conversations we've already had, edit those down the way I did with the conversations with Mikey into, you know, 10 to 15 minute sections and then repost those uh, with, with specific topics. And But I found out that, you know, that kind of editing work is more arduous 
and of an energy oh, yeah. suck than anything else that I do with all of the things that I do. I already wear too many hats, right? right? And so, um, but more importantly, what I was doing before with the channel, you know, making educational content available for free or whatever, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it didn't have the power that a real course has for a person. When you, when you enroll in a course, there's something psychologically that happens with people where you got skin in the game and you, and you take it more seriously and then you're asking yourself as you go through it, am I getting something out of this? In a way that you don't when you're just passively viewing from YouTube. No offense, YouTubers. Um, or right. podcasters for that matter. So the goal is to use these conversations as inroads to on-demand courses, courses that people can take after the fact. And so, um, look, Platypus Affiliated Society is one of the things that when I first found out about it, like I wanted to come be an intern for you. I think I might have even messaged you directly and was like, is there a way I can just come like help you? Uh, because I want to see it succeed because of all of these pro – the, what you're talking about, this lack of historical consciousness is so detrimental in organizing spaces but also when organizers go into working spaces. And oh, so yeah. – I asked you once, uh, once, once the course was kind of going with Mikey on Zizek's Four. They don't know what they do, and I was like, "This is going well. This is a good. Uh, I like this this dynamic of me being the representative of the student supposed to be confused after having done the reading, and then asking <laughs> you questions so that to, so you can unpack things in a way for for workers who are at Amazon with earbuds in, for for people who are driving right now, you know, uh -huh. and." Um, I, I said, you know, like one of my dreams would be to make the basic essentials of the Platypus Affiliated Society syllabus that you've been teaching for the last like, what, 15 years to make that pretty much yeah. to make that a solid lecture series that people would be able to take with a live cohort, but that would be available after the fact for people who might want to join in the future. Um, and you, you're like, I'm down. Let's talk about it. And so... First of all, let me push my little trainer whistle. I haven't used it on the stream yet. Let's see if it works. Did you hear that? Are you able to? I did not hear it. You did not it hear it. Not be, it may not be on my system. Let me, uh, it might not. But anyway, I, play, I played a, a train horn. So basically, Theory Underground is named underground in three ways. Theory Play went underground. Uh, it's named after the London Underground. It's right. also named after like underground movements and scenes. Um, and th as many problems as I have with the aesthetic communities that form around such things, um, right. the, the, the need, I think, is for there to be uh, places of access to go from streaming content and, and podcast content into courses that then have on the other side of them like a... Uh, uh, social media function so that people can kind of keep engaging with people who've been in the conversation longer. And so that's the ultimate vision here. And even if it doesn't work out, I just think we would probably get so much from it. Um, and so you're the first real professor um, we're announcing as somebody who might do a collaboration with Theory Underground. And so for that, first of all, congratulations and thank you. <laughs> it's a, it uh -huh. is an, it's an actual honor and I use that word unironically so mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, basically what I wanted the rest of this conversation to be about is the syllabus itself folks I've got it up on screen the first syllabus is right here and then the second syllabus I'll be able to pull it up there's two syllabuses one is for the fall autumn the other one is for the oh that's not it the, the one for spring and summer basically where mm -hmm. is it I'll have to find it. I have the link somewhere. Here we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. Win this is the winter spring t uh, a syllabus. It changes every year, but there's also things that stay the same. Is that right? Yeah, no, it, it pretty much stays the same. I mean, we've kind of honed it over the years, and it's been pretty stable for a number of years now. Um, you know, it's also modular, so we'd have to, you know, we're going to have to figure out, Dave, like how we're going to do it with Theory Underground, because it's really probably too much to do all of it, right? It's um, it's like 40 weeks or more. Um, and so it's, 
you know, basically it's a kind of like history of Marxism around three figures. Um, Marx, Lenin, and Adorno. Mm -hmm. And then it's also involving uh, the predecessors of Marx's own thought in bourgeois philosophy or bourgeois revolutionary thought. Um, you know, which is a little bit different from like the Enlightenment. Um, so it's 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 sort of honed down to like more political writings by like Kant and Hegel and others. Um, now we also do some weeks on the New Left on the '60s, but not representative of the New Left so much as paths not taken, a kind of critical New Left, right? Um, a kind of critical consciousness of the New Left moment that represented uh, the new left's own unfulfilled potential. And so really around my own teachers, like uh, Adolf Reed and Moish Postone, and, and the Spartacist League, the Trotskyists that uh, kind of uh, formed around the 60s moment, around the civil rights era and the Vietnam War era, um, and then some others. So uh, who, you know, are kind of classic uh, kind of Marxist commentators on that moment like Juliet Mitchell mm. um, and so there are just different different parts of it and so we probably have to hone it down for our purposes here right. um, you know and, and get to the essentials of it so it's kind of like what did Marx take for granted we read that from like Adam Smith and, and others um, what did Lenin and others like Rosa Luxemburg and Trotsky take for granted in Marx, like what are they, what are the works that they're citing the most, like Marx's political writings, um, for their, for their vision and for their, you know, moment of, of like revolutionary kind of politics. Um, and then the Frankfurt School and the Frankfurt School's roots in, um, Lukács and, uh, Karl Korsch. Um, and so the Frankfurt School kind of not comprehensively, but, you know, Horkheimer, Benjamin, Adorno, um, you know, kind of centered around Adorno. So that's why I mentioned Marx, Lenin, and Adorno as like the central figures. They're not the exclusive figures, but they are the central figures um, because it poses a question, right? It poses a question of what Marxism was and, um, and how how Marxism formulated itself originally in Marx's own moment in his own thinking mm -hmm. and then how it was attempted to be followed by subsequent generations um, and then how its memory was there was a struggle to preserve the memory of Marxism in the form of Trotskyism and the Frankfurt School basically and both of which were marginal and almost irrelevant and were seen uh, with some hostility from the established like mass political movement on the left right so like it's like I don't know I when I studied Adorno for example um, Adorno was really hated right um, like some respect was given to him but a kind of grudging respect of someone that you hate in which right? circles Benjamin they liked but they didn't they, they hated Adorno Who's the they in this context? The, the left, and uh, that includes the academic left, right? Um, so, you know, Adorno was a kind of ritual figure to denounce um, in an academic left context. Uh, you know, he was elitist, he was racist, he was this, he was that, in the same way that, like, Trotsky is a ritually denounced figure on the left, right? right? And, you know, which is you know, peculiar and, and also says something about Marxism that, you know, Marxism is not going to make you popular. Right. Marxism is no. not going to make you popular, uh, which is ironic considering the great kind of esteem that Marx has on the left. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of ritual invocation and deference given to the, to Marx. But then when you get down to it, people don't really agree with Marx. Right. And so again, it's not about agreeing with Marx. It's about, well, what was what was all that? Like Marx is one of the most like important political philosophers of all time, and Marxism as a political movement, like Lenin, 
is like you know the greatest revolutionary movement of all time you know and uh for good or for ill right it's like what is this thing and so you know the fact that we live in a post marxist era in the shadow of marxism it would be nice to know what it was right so it's very much a primary text kind of reading list it's trying to understand things in their own terms trying to understand how these people actually thought what they thought they were doing mm-hmm. and how they thought about it right sort of inhabit the mindset um and consider it in other words it's not just a matter of like you know reproducing it or following it but just confronting it dealing with it engaging with it right that, um that's, because that's, that's that's the way i've learned and that's the way i teach so i've learned a lot from things i disagree with i like i've learned a great deal from thinkers that i really disagree with you know i disagree with their approach i disagree with what they're doing with their thinking i disagree with their political objectives you know like i learned a lot from reading heidegger i learned a lot from reading like carl schmidt i learned a lot from reading uh you know eduard bernstein mm-hmm. you know i've just i've learned a lot from reading things that i re- you know like maoism i have serious disagreements with maoism i learned a lot nonetheless from reading a lot of maoism and so it's not a matter of like only learning from what you think you agree with because that's the other thing you might think you agree with it and you might sort of you know uh indoctrinate yourself with it but you might not actually agree with it when you scratch the surface right the agreement might be rather superficial mm and so you know again just you know thinking about it and you know what is this about what was this about what what might it mean now you know because it's not clear what marxism means right now actually it's not clear so again the platypus the puzzle Th- where this... does this fit into you know where we are historically now exactly this is why i mean this is why i've i've seen your value I, I'm not going to say I saw it in its totality or that I fully understand whatever, but I'm just saying like I can see some value in what you're doing and I think it's tremendous over and above almost anything being done by anyone online when it comes to like left media because uh, they all perform the function and role of the influencer as opposed to the educator. And so in a sense, I would say Platypus Affiliated Society has been doing underground theory in a, in a, in a sense for – a while. Yes. yes. Right. I mean, it's funny how, you know, I feel like a lot of what I learned on the left was in the form of things that were kind of underground classics or cult classics or like forbidden texts or something or like, you know, forgotten things in the used bookstore, you know, where it's like, what the hell is this, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know so it's kind of like yeah i used to also say that platypus we it was like the night thoughts of marxism right so like you know a marxist who's suffering from insomnia at two o'clock in the morning what are the thoughts that are troubling them Mm. that are giving them nightmares you know like looking at it that way rather than you know the kind of forthright clear light of day kind of positive aspect you know what what kind of troubling thoughts does this stuff give you what questions and problems does it raise because that's really for me the significance of marxism is that marxism raises problems that we have not solved no it raises questions that we do not have clear answers to Right. And the idea that we're still dealing with these problems, that we're still, you know, facing these questions and that, again, it's it's not like, you know, there's there's a whole realm of philosophy and political thinking out there that does raise all sorts of questions. But it's kind of like the ones that are the most troubling come out of this history of Marxism. 
you know, you know, like what is socialism? What is capitalism? What is the state? What is democracy? You know, what are rights? Where do they come from? Like just like really profound questions that, and also that are very much about the modern world. In other words, rather than, you know, some kind of ancient problems from Plato and Aristotle or, or from out, outside the Western tradition. Um, but really like, our world, like our recognizable modern capitalist world, what are we struggling with? Because we seem to be circling back around to the same kind of issues in a recurrent way, you know, in right, the last like, 200 years. It's one thing to say that there's, oh, everyone's stuck in old scripts and narratives, something I do say, but it's one thing to say that. It's another, and it's another to think, what are the conditions of possibility to make those old scripts and narratives something that, pe that makes people feel alive again or gives people a sense of purpose again. Um, it, it, you know, 1970s IDPOL and 1920s Marxism wouldn't be uh, something that people are forming their entire online and real organizing identities around if there wasn't something to it. Right. Right? That's where, by the way, so how did I get, like, recruited back to the left, if you will, through Platypus, I just thought, okay, I'm a Marxist, kind of, you know, like, it's sort of, you know, I got touched by the dark genius of Marx and Marxism, and I can't really quite shake it, but really, young people were interested, and I was like, okay, right, uh, meaning, you know, I teach it in the cl academic classroom, that's different because then it's like the history of ideas and it's kind of canonical and classic. And also, you know, insofar as there's demand, you know, my classes are always fully enrolled and so they keep renewing the classes, you know. Um, so it seems relevant on the curriculum. Um, you know, there's a demand for it. But it is more like, you know, institutionally canonized in a way. Whereas in the world, right, people are still reaching back to Marxism and people on the left and on the right, by the way, even right wing sure. people are like, yeah, what did Marx say about that again? Right? Like, it seems like these things are recalled out of our political and social reality. Right. You know, right. and that's where I feel like, okay, so long as people are reaching back for this stuff, then there's a real task to take it seriously and not do a kind of superficial hack job, not, not, not a memified kind of Marxism or something, or some kind of like degraded photocopy, you know? Um, but rather, you know, okay, what is it? You know, because again, there is this kind of fascination. People can't quite shake the specter of Marx, the specter mm -hmm. of Marxism. Like I said, left and right. You know, and, you know, I think the right does a hack job. The left kind of does a hack job, too, though. Yeah. Right. It's definitely reduced to a kind of, you know, bowdlerized kind of set of precepts that have very little to do with what it actually was, you know. Um, and, you know, but again, I, I take for granted that people are authentically interested intellectually in a way that isn't just on the menu of cultural commodities that the society kind of regurgitates in the cycle of fashion, right? right? That there's more to it than that. And we need to be true to that as, as best we can. Right. And so one of the things that Steve Roberts said in the chat was what to say about the platypus reading groups education. I'm 66, an ex coal miner leftist in the UK. What I would give to have had such an education available 40 years ago. Come on, guys. Find Marxism. And what I wanted to say is uh, I do want to kind of actually scroll down the syllabus on both sides. I know that like a lot of people okay. a lot of people find syllabus day like the most boring day of college, but this isn't college. And you're only, <laughs> people are only right. here because they're curious to know what you actually say and what you actually teach and right. what you have. Right. Think about it, folks. If, if For anybody who's like kind of watching kind of in a disinterested manner, I want you to really do a thought experiment for a moment where you're in a position of responsibility 
or relative special t- special specialization a- expertise authority on a field that becomes politically relevant again yeah. and then people want you to teach it and then you actually create an organization outside of the university to let it propagate across the United States and the rest of the world where it current I mean there's platypus groups all over the world now and not only do you have like these national conventions and the 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 monthly review that people add to and all of this stuff but your 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 eyes are on most of it if not all of it so that means that for almost 15 years here you have been um mm-hmm. sort of the custodian of of this and, and a lot of people can be critical oh well, i don't like the article that you wrote or i don't like this right. one opi- i don't like this opinion that you have but that's because they care about influencers and takes they don't care right. about teaching and so right. I want to th- I want to think about platypus as an educational thing that's nonpartisan, nonsectarian, and mm-hmm. and mainly just like I want you to kind of tell tell us about like what is it what is the sort of academic uh, response like how are you treated how do people perceive platypus how do people perceive you and and sort of what's the, tell us. Something, just some drama. I want to know kind of like what yeah, kinds of drama. Yeah, the controversy around platypus, right? Yeah. So I had a feeling it was going to be controversial when we started. Because, look, my teachers were controversial. Spartacus League was controversial. Adolf Reed was controversial. I mean, I know that, you know, he is someone that people show a lot of respect for. When I knew Adolf, when I was first reading him, he mm-hmm. was controversial, right still is like he still is but i'm talking like people did not give like token gestures of respect okay right instead it was like he's a right winger right uh you know because he criticized jesse jackson Mm. right that made him into a right winger right and so it's like damn so I kind of knew what we were in for to a certain extent, but also I thought, well, we'll just proceed in good faith. And again, we really started, you know, we, we had a reading group, but then we started as an organization and really became like a public group, if you will, um, because we were hosting these public fora discussions, um, panel discussions, which the left, I mean, this might strike people as very strange. The left doesn't really have conversations among themselves, right? Like each tendency, each intellectual kind of proceeds as if the others don't exist, right? It's, it's, it's crazy that way. And, you know, so anyway, we thought we could do a mix of like activist organizations, Marxist left organizations, but also other kinds of organizations like anarchists or even liberal organizations, academics, whether calling themselves Marxists or anarchists or just liberals or post-Marxists or what have you, we could sort of do this as a public activity, not debates so much as conversations, right? So not just like two perspectives, but like multiple perspectives. So ironically, what got us into trouble, what, what raised the controversy early on was the usual left bullshit which is that some people didn't like other people that we had invited to participate in the discussion, right? So they they objected to who we were including, you know, because they wanted us to exclude the people that they would exclude. And it's like, no, the whole point of this is we're not going to exclude anybody, right? We're going to deal with the whole range of the self-identified left. Anyone who calls themselves a leftist, we're, you know open to having part of the conversation and you know not just in terms of the audience certainly the audience for sure but but more importantly the speakers right so you know the whole i mean look all this stuff like platforming and not platforming this goes back to the 60s and 70s if not to the 30s -hmm. right this whole thing this whole repressive exclusive leftism right obviously is just you can't start there because the left is dead look we're just we're we're at we're at ground zero here right with the millennials right so it's 2007 you know people are in their early 20s 
my students. And, you know, they're trying to build something up from the ground floor, ground zero here, you know, baseline. You know, take nothing for granted. All bets are off. We can't assume any of the positions of the past because they all have led nowhere at this point in 2007. And, you know, we really were sincerely interested in what people had to say as speakers. And also in conversation, meaning not just rehearsing their canned line, but really stimulating each other to think on their feet, to speak their mind and interact. And again, the, the first controversy around Platypus really had to do with some speakers objecting to other speakers we had invited. Of course. And then, like, you must be up to no good because you're inviting so-and-so. And it's like, no, right? We're just not going to do that. We're not going to exclude a Is... priori. We really are not. And, uh, like, in other words, everybody's equally problematic, and everybody potentially has something worthwhile to contribute on the left. Right? That And that just, people didn't like that. They just didn't like that. And I have to say it shocked me a little bit. Because I was like, come on, man. I was like, be honest. You know, you guys in your 60s and 50s and at that point, you know, maybe in their late 40s. I was like, you got to admit that we're back to square one here. And so you just can't keep this shit, you know, these entrenched oppositions. You just can't keep that going indefinitely. That's not helping anybody. You know, these are young people who want to know. Make your case, convince them. Talk about it. Right? Like, just just try to teach the new generation. But they were like, oh, you must be operating with an ulterior motive. And I was like, well, okay, here's our ulterior motive. You're all dead. Politically, you're all dead. You know, you you got nothing, man. Unless you got something, in which case, come come give it. Come say it. Right? Otherwise, you know? Yeah. And, Yo, and if you're going to be ears. hostile, you're kind of proving how dead you are. Right. Yeah, the, the more hostile and hysterical or whatever you are, the more it's, you know, it seems suspiciously useless. like, it seems like nothing's really going on there, is there? Yeah, you know? just useless, unproductive, just like you're not doing shit. You're proving the point, right? right. And, you know, I mean, it's funny. So it was, you know, it was about like, you know, we were in the anti-war movement moment of course, I was against the war on terror. Of course, I was against the U.S. invading and occupying Afghanistan and Iraq. Of course, I was against the Patriot Act and everything else. And of course, I was against the George W. Bush administration. But, you know, there were some people on the left who were like, well, let's think for a second what we're, what we're doing here. Like, yes, we're all against the war, but, you know, how do we think about these things, right? How do we, how do we orient ourselves around these things? And so there were criticisms of the anti-war movement, and we wanted to include those voices. So my my non-historical memory here is just that, like before, you know, at, when I was uh, not even a teenager yet, there were some real pushes in places like Seattle to be anti-imperialist. I think you know there was like a yeah. whole anti-globalization movement back before globalization sure. became a bad word uh, for progressives who think, oh, that's just Alex Jones, you know. Um, right. And then no, the that, left. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then that kind of culminated in like a giant protest movement against the, the war in, in Afghanistan, going to Afghanistan in the first place. And that... Certainly all, for Iraq, though, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for Iraq, yeah. And that, that all of that protest amounted to very little. Um, and, right, and it then, didn't affect anything, but it did sort of establish, like, it, it like radicalized young people. Right. Right? It sort of, you know, activated them politically. They were engaged. They wanted to know. Yeah. And, you know... I mean, you know, so anti-imperialism, fine. I mean, that's like the first public discussion that we hosted was on the question of imperialism. What is it? Why should we be against it? 
And you know, one of our one of our members at the time, an older guy who was a veteran of the '60s left, a former Maoist, said, "Why aren't Why aren't we calling the discussion?" What is imperialism, and why we should be against it? Why are you posing it as a question? Why are you posing? Why aren't you posing it as, you know, what is imperialism, and why we should be against it, rather than why should we be against it? And I was like, well, because let's just leave that question open. What is it, and why should we be against it? Right. Which is not to say we shouldn't be against it. It's just to say why should we be against it, rather than positively. You know, imperialism, we know it's bad. It's like, okay, sure, it's bad. It's the course. highest it's form of capitalism. Thing. Yeah, it's like, ooh, highest form of capitalism. That must mean it's – but that doesn't really answer much, you know. And so – doesn't. And everybody's anti-imperialist anyway. You ask any capitalist politician, are you an imperialist? They would say no. Like right. George W. Bush would have said, we are not imperialists. We're right. against imperialism. Well, Saddam Hussein like, is an imperialist. Or whatever. You, you know, like – so it's just like a dirty word that everybody says is bad. And so, you know, but what does the left mean by it? You know, why are we against it? You know, maybe we're against it on the left for a different reason than the reason that Barack Obama might be against it. And how to be against it. You know, that's the... Right, and how to be against it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, because, I mean, that's right now the... What, like, who's really doing anything super focused on anti-imperialism right now except for like Richard Medhurst and Caleb Maupin like in, as far as like the the Oh you mean right now the you mean YouTube like the Ukraine war oh man yeah. I yeah. mean it's a mess isn't it because yeah. haven't we come like 360 180 I mean I don't know what we've done we've done some kind of like stunting here you know yeah. some kind of donuts with our muscle car you know I don't yeah. know what you know like yeah it's funny yeah, so the right are the now the anti-imperialists. And it's like, huh, well, what does that tell you? Yeah. You know, there's right-wing anti-imperialism. You know, the Nazis were against imperialism. Oh I mean, God. I hate to do that. You know, the Godwin's law, everything goes to Nazism. But just think for a second. Right. This right. Well, a good example of... What, it wasn't America first like originally a conservative anti-imperialist activist front like in the 60s or earlier than that maybe like i i think uh, there was an america first conservative group that was against the war and so there's always been like that thread you know as far as but well, I mean, in the 30s in the 30s there was oh, okay. a right wing opposition to getting involved in world war 2 okay there was a conservative critique of the cold war there was mm -hmm. most definitely um, there was a paleoconservative opposition to the neocons in the in the later Cold War, in the second Cold War of the Reagan era. Um, you know, there is, right? And so, again, but again, just on the left, because it's not like we wanted to include, like, people who call themselves right-wing. So why not include people who call themselves right-wing? Because the right doesn't want to make socialism, right? Right. Like, the right doesn't want socialism. So... You know, the left and, you know, even liberals will say that they want, like, socialism, whatever that means, usually, like, welfare state or something. Um, but so, you know, generally speaking, the left, um, you know, agrees on a general direction of progress. Honestly, yet, it seems you know, like the, the, right, the right is increasingly warm towards various welfare state things as long as it would prioritize Catholics or whatever, you know, it's like <laughs> you got the, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't. Or maybe not even, be, maybe they just would be like a national kind of welfare state, like Americans of whatever religion or whatever, you know, that each, each, <laughs> pardon me, each nation should take care of its citizens, you know, just very basic kind right. of, you know, there is a, there is a right that's like that. Sure. Well, in this, and they all give lip service to that, by the way. We shouldn't get transfixed by neoliberalism. Even the neoliberals, right, they thought that their policy was going to benefit everybody. Right. At least potentially. Right? So they just disagreed with the welfare state over how to better people's lives. Right? They were like, well, the welfare state keeps people poor, which is true. Which right. is true. Mm -hmm. Right? 
And so, again, it's kind of like, well, socialism in the sense of not just opposing capitalism because it's greed and it's this and that, um, you know, not just opposing capitalism in the name of altruism, but opposing capitalism in the sense of, you know, let's fundamentally change society. Okay. And so the left, you know, the left. Um, not like the way in mainstream politics people call the Democrats the left. Right. You know, Democratic Party politicians, most of them will not say, I'm a leftist. Yeah. Right? And so the left. And that's what, you know, came into a new kind of public prominence in the millennial era. So the left was very marginal in most of, you know, my younger lifetime. But, you know, the left got more of a hearing, starting with the anti-war movement and subsequently through, like, the Great Recession and through, like, Occupy Wall Street. And right. obviously, the culmination of that was the Sanders campaign. Right. right? And so, for me, the that was it. Was I, I wasn't even politically paying attention at all. Um, in, in, I was just trying to party to make up for last time because I, as a kid, I, you know, didn't go to high school and I wasn't able to party. So I was just like that homeschool kid who was trying to catch up in the music scene and, and party and uh, getting in trouble. And so uh, I was on tour with a band um, during some Occupy stuff going on. And I had mm -hmm. no idea. I had no idea what was going on. I, I just didn't really care. And we were in Seattle um, on this tour. I was just roadieing. And uh, we ended up staying at like an anarchist like pad, you know, some filthy mm -hmm. place where everybody's crashing. Squat. Yeah, it was a squat basically. And uh, the – I. I I don't remember a single word uttered in any of the conversations had, but I remember being drunk and high and having really good conversations and being like, oh my God, this stuff's really interesting. And then I kind of didn't really pay attention to politics much after that. Uh, and, and then went, later when I went to university, I read a little Marx and then like very soon after reading Marx and, you know, it really impacting me because um, it made sense of so much of my, my working class uh -huh. life. Um, there was the the Bernie campaign came along and I was like, oh my God, they're going to talk about the working class again. Cool. You know, <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah. And That's you know, democratic story. socialism, <laughs> like the way Bernie identified himself. Um, and then the DSA getting on board with that. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, so again, like the controversy around platypus to me is like a kind of a, it's a symptom of the problem that our project was trying to address, right? And so, you know, when when the messenger has bad news, you, won't, you it's easier to kill the messenger than to deal with the problem, right? right. And so right. that's the controversy around platypus. Now, you know, insofar as we raised our profile and established a kind of geographical presence, and also insofar as, you know, there was a kind of, a lot of Sturm und Drang, a lot of like um, wild changes in the, in the world going on, then I have felt the need to be provocative and sort of gird students against or young people against illusions that I knew were going to be on the way. And so, you know, again, the first controversy was the anti-war movement. The second controversy was around the Trump election. Where basically, you know, I I knew that there was going to be a hysteric anti-Trumpism, and I knew that that was not going to be good for any potential socialist left. Um, and so I, you know, wrote "Why Not Trump," and I kind of pushed it. And even though I was very careful to say some things and not say other things, still, right? It was like red brown alliance right and so it was some right. kind of like madness and i think that that again it's like i i guess became a lightning rod in doing that for something more general which is that the the kind of progressive liberal kind of quote-unquote left they are hostile to the so-called white working class in the united states mm -hmm. they are and so you know at the very least they're suspicious but generally they're hostile Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, the Democratic Party is basically like, you know, unions should endorse Democrats and members of unions should follow the unions and endorsing the Democrats and voting for the Democrats. And that's in their best interest. And just otherwise just shut up, right? Vote for the Democrats, but otherwise we don't want to hear, right? That, and, that, ar- that article, you know? the article you're referencing is the very one that I was referencing when I said, Ooh, Katron wrote a controversial article. Ooh. Yeah, because it was just titled, Why Not Trump? And if I remember correctly, you, you're, it's very obvious if you're even – if you read it a little bit charitably, it's like At obvious all. what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, if you get past the headline, if you get past the title, which yeah. many people don't because they treat it as like, well, why not? Why not go to the movies? Right? Why not go to McDonald's? You know, it's like, no, no. Like, very literally, why not Trump? Right? Can, you, can you kind of expand and, on, on that for everybody here? Well, you know, basically, it's like, anybody but Trump? You know? Like, Hillary, it doesn't matter. Anybody but Trump. Right? John McCain instead of Trump. That's been the attitude, you know? yeah. Mitt Romney instead of Trump. Ted Cruz instead of Trump. Maybe. I don't know. You know? Anybody but Trump. And I just thought, okay, um, this is something I'm familiar with from having grown up in the 80s and maniacal anti- anti-Reaganism, but also from the earlier history of Platypus, anti-Bushism. Like George W. Bush was like a fascist. Right. And he was a white supremacist. He was a Christian crusader. He wanted to kill all Muslims. Um, You know, under his administration, the military was being told that they were leading a Christian crusade to wipe out the Muslims. Of course, not true. (laughs) Um, You know, like just these these ridiculous perspectives on the left um, really deranged. And it's like, deal with reality, right? And, you know, the reality is Trump might be elected and it's not going to be the end of the world. It's actually not going to be the end of the world. Like, don't lose your mind. Don't use it as an excuse to lose your mind. And especially don't use it as an excuse to concede to the Democrats. So, yeah, you were... That will be the end end of any kind of leftism. It always is. You were, in a sense, uh, saying, hey, everybody, brace yourselves. Trump derangement syndrome is coming, and it's not going to lead to anything better. And here we have Biden, and it's the... I mean, talk about, like, the best example of how president matters a lot less than cabinet and how you can be basically asleep at the wheel, you know? It's like... The the most interesting thing we saw from from Biden was his his uh, his evil dark empire speech, like where he's like, did you see that shit? Where like the the a little unintentionally though, right? And so what happened was they framed it wrong, meaning he was standing in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and it's actually lit with the three colors: red, white, and blue. But the central color is red, and they kind of cropped out the white and the blue, so that it looked like, yeah, he was oh. arriving from the Sith temple or something. And, <laughs> yeah, it was, like, very bizarre. And I was like, fucking millennials are so incompetent. <laughs> Do you know how to compose an image? Can you pinch yourself? Can you wake up? So, so you were, you were, like, you were not no? convinced by, you were not convinced by Vosh's position that this was the coolest messaging sent by the Biden administration to date because it's a it's a single it's a it's a signal that they're not messing around and they're coming for Trump and they're going to Dark Brandon gonna, Dark Brandon Dark Brandon Yeah No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, it's just stupidity, foolishness. It was a mistake. Like the red backdrop, it was just a mistake. Right? I mean, I guess you could say it was a mistake that was let pass because unconsciously they, you know, the Biden staff wanted to be the dark Brandon, you know, like Sith executioners of, of the Trumpists, I guess, 
you know, but I'm just like, no, nah, this is dumb. You know, especially because, you know, like Biden is funny. So, you know, Trump's presidency was pretty bad. It was. And, you know, it might be, might have been one of the worst presidencies of all time, perhaps. But then the Biden presidency is even worse. And, you know, and Trump's an intemperate, like, you know, loudmouth kind of asshole, you know. And then Biden also is, though. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's just funny. He's like the Democrats version of Trump. Yeah. He really is. <laughs> you know, and um, and it's just like, wow. You know, because basically it's like the lid has been blown off. And the whole polished Obama, whatever, is just gone. And we're just full on yellow journalism, you know, total tabloid headlines, 24 seven nonstop. Like, okay, this is, this is what we're going to be doing now. You know, it's everything, you know, it's Hunter Biden. Okay. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like, it's, it's the it's, most, you know, it's the, uh, you know, uh, Lolita Express, Jeffrey Epstein. How many times did Trump get on the Lolita Express? Right. You know, it's just like, it's just, this is the world that, that capitalist politics has led to. And, you know, we can't really do anything about it. Right. So we have to try to see what is going on and not be distracted by the noise. I think that's a perfect pivot point here into Q&A session. We're doing the Ask Me Anything portion. Nance, if you, and also Adam, I see you there in the chat if you're going to want to hop in here and ask Catrone how to homeschool your daughter or whatever. I, I saw him talking about something related to that in the chat. Um, you're going to be welcome to, uh, but I've got a rapid fire question for you. Chris, and that is, uh, which of these people is more controversial, uh, who you have worked with at Platypus, or who you, uh, and, or is there any of them that you haven't worked with? My, 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 my sense is that you've probably had all these people uh, involved with Platypus events, but Grover Fur, Michael Parenti, Norman Finkelstein, Vivek Cheber, or Adolf Reed Jr., who is the most controversial you've dealt with? a good question i mean obviously um controversial to whom right yeah uh controversial to me um grover fur of course right because he's a star um, yeah because you know he's basically like yeah the the purge trials were correct all the charges against trotsky he was actually guilty of right. and i'm like yeah i don't think so <laughs> you know so that's what i would controvert if you will right um but, you know, um, obviously I have criticisms of all of the above, mm -hmm. right? I have serious differences with Vivek Chibber, politically, his perspective on things. Um, the general DSA, uh, both political and theoretical orientation. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that would be, you know, most important controversy would be between me and Vivek Chibber. Um, you know, a debate, if you will, between me and Vivek Chibber would be more meaningful than a debate between me and Grover Fur, I think. I mean, it depends on for what purposes. Um, you know, because I'm not sure that, like, defending Trotskyism is the point in 2023 so much as defending Marxism. And so I'd be interested in defending Marxism against, like, the Vivek Chibber kind of revision of it. Is um, your, who is else did your, you mention? So those two stood out for me. I'll, I'll come back to them in a second, but on Vivek, um, my question, I guess, so when I think of him, I think what, what he what he's good for is like this, he is the Indian man critical of post-colonial, primarily Indian uh, theory, right? Um, you know, so, I agree with him on that. Generally, right. okay. I mean, I generally agree with him on that. Although a friend of mine, Sunit Singh, did write a critique of um, Vivek's critique of postcolonialism, even okay. though Sunit is also critical of postcolonialism. Basically, the idea was Vivek's criticism is not the right criticism. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting, you know. But again, um, I think that. I think that there is still a kind of rational kernel or point to Vivek's criticism. I don't think of Vivek primarily in that vein. I think of him as 
um, you know, a theorist of what is the necessary socialist politics for our time. Okay. Right. And so a subset of that involves the critique of post-colonialism. Okay. Right. Um, but really, I think that that critique of post-colonialism comes from his political perspective, meaning his intellectual critique of post-colonial theory is actually a political critique of uh, post-colonialism. It is. Um, as, as an abandonment of the struggle for socialism. In class policies, right. exactly. And yeah. so that's that's where I differ with Vivek about what is necessary for the struggle for socialism. And okay. not we don't disagree on everything by any means. We agree sure. on a lot, right? But we do disagree on some things that I think are important. Well, right. maybe maybe someday in my in my ideal future, I get to uh, uh, MC the that conversation with the two of I you. I mean, it would be, you know, again, something that he would not be very friendly to. It would be over things that he thinks are irrelevant, sectarian concerns, like the dictatorship of the proletariat, mm -hmm. things like that, um, you know, which, again, I would say, you know, that's the skeleton in the closet of Marxism. Right. And so you can't pretend it's not there. And you can't cede it to the sectarian Marxist organizations. You can't just say, oh, you know, Trotskyists and Maoists talk about that. We don't need to talk about that. Like, you know, we need to be, we need to get real politically. And it's like, well, you know, that was really Marx's perspective. And also, it's what the right thinks you're doing. Yeah. And so you got to deal with it. You got to deal with the meaning of it, and you got to deal as honestly as possible with it, and not sort of, you know, transmogrify it into whatever you want it to be, you know, not just redefine it, and and sort of dodge the real issue. So you know, I mean, it would, you know, it's one of these things. But I think that the DSA generally, I mean, I've t I've written about this. They do disagree with Marxism fundamentally. They do. And yeah. uh, they, at the same time, they also claim to be Marxist and they seek to participate in a kind of monopolization of Marxism. They do, you know, they, they kind of want to be uh, the definers of what Marxism is and isn't at the same time that they disagree with it. And I think that's, that's a dishonesty and it's a, it's a problem. It's it an intellectual problem. It's a theoretical problem. And it bears on some political problems, right? Because right. I'm not just here to say we have to be politically Marxist. Because, again, what does that even mean? Well, for them, okay. I think it just means it's their cop-out from actually having to organize and, and give a fuck about regular working people. And instead, they get to do this technocratic, elitist, PMC fucking... Uh, sure. Like, oh, sure. well, we represent the oppressed loop and proles and we don't give a fuck about workers who don't agree with us. And that's the tendency. And so like that, I mean, obviously there are uh, a variety of splinters and factions within uh, that, oh, yeah. all, that are advocating for some something else. But, you know, that is the general tendency that they're fighting against. So, but I would also say that, you know, maybe in the future after I've read and reread your syllabus and I feel like I've finally come to a point where I'm based enough in this discourse that you've been in for so long. <laughs> right. Maybe maybe we can have this disagreement if I still disagree with you sure. at that point. But sure, right sure. now, right now I think it would basically be a waste of time because one of the things that I tell everybody is like, you want to be critical, why don't you read and reread stuff first? Right? Like you want to be radical, that's what that would mean. And so we one of the uh, the new article I just put out called The Three Principles of Study uh, as a way of mm -hmm. life. Um it's mm -hmm. about how reading and writing comes before real conversation. And if you skip reading and writing in a rigorous sense, then you aren't going to have real conversation. You're going to have mere talking, idle chatter, bullshit. And so yeah. I, 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 I want to be able to someday get to the point where we can have a, a worthwhile disagreement if I still disagree with you at that point. And I don't even know right. if I will until we do this, this course. So, um, uh -huh. The other names on the list, though, were uh, – so we already talked about Grover Fur and Vivek Chibber. The other names are Michael Parenti, Norman Finkelstein, and Adolf Reed Jr. 
Right. So Adolf is controversial, um, again, in ways that I think are more symptomatic of the problems on the left. Um, although I would also have my disagreements with him. On other um, things. About what he would call Leninism or Trotskyism, um, you know, because he's more in the kind of left communist council communist tradition in terms of his, you know, uh, you know what he believes in, that, that strand of Marxism. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I have disagreements there. Um, I kind of understand where he's coming from and I'm sympathetic to, you know, his criticism of the existing Marxist Leninist left. Um, but, but, um, I think that, uh, there's a potential problem there. And then we disagree also in the meantime, he tends to be a kind of right social Democrat. You know, he was a Bernie crowd for sure. Uh, he also, you know, Interestingly, even though he disagrees with identity politics, he disagrees with identity politics. He still said that the Bernie voters in the primaries who did not turn out for Hillary were sexist. They're not voting for Hillary. And I'm like, how's that? Oh. I did not know that he said that. Yeah. Oh, no, he wrote a whole article about it. For real? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was in The Progressive. Right, because I wouldn't vote and, for I wouldn't vote for Hillary, and I wouldn't vote for Biden. And you know, Biden's a man, so not that it's you know not that it's terribly important who we vote for. It isn't because we're a small, tiny minority of people. But again, as a lesson in politics, right? As a lesson in politics, the whole we have to stop the Republicans at all cost. I just feel like actually we need to uh, proceed in such a way that it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in office. Right. The tasks remain the same. The tasks are the same in a red state as in a blue state. You know, uh, that the the idea that somehow things are better for us on the left. In terms of doing what has to be done, organizing a socialist politics, that somehow it's better under the Democrats to do that than under the Republicans. We cannot concede that. Because then we will always be sacrificing what needs to be done in favor of prioritizing keeping the Democrats in power. Right. That will always be the case. Right. It will um, never change. You know? And I also, I mean, from, from my position, like what I advocate for is for people in representative and authoritative uh, or influencer positions, leadership positions as well within political organizations, uh, ultimately... My, I, what I advocate for is you need to respect and honor the fact that you're not trusted by most people and you need to appeal to that and, <laughs> and, and base everything around that. And if you scapegoat people who don't trust you, if you scapegoat people who don't believe what you oh. think they should believe, then you are the primary problem because I don't want to live in the world where you have power. And so until I see a, a post-trust movement that – doesn't gaslight, epistemologically gaslight, or social blackmail regular working people, uh, I think the number one thing is critique, interpretation, not fun, you know, not organize the working class. I, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that until I see a change within whatever major organizations exist, like in, in their approach to these, these matters. Because right, right now, right. it's like right now, right now, if the DSA were to take power for some reason, I would be against them. Right. Like I just I don't want it. I don't want to be in that world. Right. I would rather be in the world where Trump and Biden are ruining everything than a bunch of self-proclaimed socialists keep ruining everything. Yeah. But tell us that it's for our own good. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, for real. So so that's my beef with Adolf. And I think, you know, he's a little bit stuck in the Reagan era. You know, I think he abandoned the struggle for socialism when Reagan was elected in favor of fighting the right. And there, there's some point to that. There is some point to that. But I think, no, not 40 years later, no. Sorry, no. Um, and Michael Parenti, I, I, I'm not sure that he is terribly controversial to me. I mean, we would have some disagreements. But what, what's controversial about him? Remind me of what should be, what would be controversial about Michael Parenti. 
Well, you're kind of bringing this into, like, for you, what's your beef with any of these people? My question is more along the lines... Oh, okay. I, Sorry. I am interested. I am interested in your, in, uh-huh. your, in your takes, but I am also... I'm saying as the person who has who has been associated with platforming some of these people, who do you yeah. catch the most flack for? Like I imagine it's probably Grover Fur, but it could be Parenti for just being very popular at defending the Soviet Union in a lot of ways, right? So I don't know. Oh, sure. Um, right. So uh, no, we didn't get – I mean who do we get flack for? You know, um, we get flack for other kinds of people. Like, um, you know, like Doug Henwood turned against Platypus because we invited Paul Berman, who was a critic of the anti-war movement. Um, you know, he also didn't like that we had the RCP USA, you know, um, the, the kind of post Maoist, like kind of new left Maoist American organization. Cause he's like, well, they're a cult. And it's like, yeah, as opposed to what the Democrats are not a cult, you know, like, you know, like that's, that's a lame, you know, and, um, so we've, you know, and we've also, because Platypus is in Germany, we got into trouble for kind of highlighting a very prominent tendency on the German left, the anti-Deutsch, um, you know, who we don't agree with. But, uh, or at least I don't agree with them, but they were an important phenomenon on the, on the German left and, and among young people on the German left. And so, you know, you can't just pretend, again, the whole idea that we're going to pretend that the people we disagree with don't exist. Right. You know, or or, or, or the worst thing, the worst thing is to pretend that the people we don't agree with who have appeared on platforms are responsible for the regular working people who agree with them because those regular working people are just stupid dupes who get inseminated by ideas in this sort of Dawkins like sense of memes that oh, just yeah. come like right. they think they think that, that that it's a social contagion theory of ideas and that right. that that oh it's Joe Rogan's fault that people believe this and it's this person's fault that people believe that and it's like oh my god that is that oh, is yeah. as if people wouldn't have been taking ivermectin if Joe Rogan hadn't said something about it. Right. 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 And so, you know, so it, it, look, the left is censorious. It is. And again, that's out of its weakness. That's out of its dead character. Um, you know, but it is censorious. Right. And the mainstream, quote unquote, left, the Democrats are very censorious. Um, the far left is censorious. And again, I I don't favor that kind of censoriousness at all. But I also think, you know, there's no justification for it, like, really. Um, and, you know, again, what are we talking about? We're talking about kind of, you know, Christine was talking about this policing boundaries, right? Gatekeeping. Right. Um, so it's it's really... You know, even though it's supposedly in service of a greater political mission, the real purpose of it and the real effect of it is much more on the internal life of the left itself. Right? It's not like the left no platforming people gets rid of whatever problem they think they represent. It just shuts down any anything within the left. Right, and it's it's a kind of a just a bad culture. It's a bad vibe, right. and it's 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 a culture of defeat. It's a culture of failure. It's um, you know, like I said, it's a symptom, it's, and it's kind of like you know, what what do we? Why do we have the censorious attitude? Um, nobody questions that, right? And uh, and it's kind of like, you know, so I am like. You know, uh, I do believe in debate, critique, conversation. Um, you know, I do believe in, you know, airing things out and not tabooing them, right. exposing things. 
and not suppressing them. In other words, uh, I do believe that maybe the best way an idea is defeated is in exposing it, like just allowing it voice, like just, you know. Um, I do think that that's probably, you know, like intellectually that's a more honest approach, but also politically it's probably more effective. Well, I've, I've seen um, you know, people. I've seen like, people. Bring it who, to the light of day. Go ahead. I've seen people who think that having Grover Fur on means that you're Stalinist sympathizers or whatever. And it's like, if you watch the panel, like at least the one that I watched, like Alizar yeah. was Alizar was in the audience and got to ask, you know lean it you know chew into him because Alizar, he's someone I was involved with in a political organization in the past and. Alizar has like made it his life's mission to basically debunk fur. And the fact is, it's like these kinds of contradictions don't get to play out where people can see them uh, when it's all put beneath the rug. And, and what, what, what was what this whole stay in your lane thing that uh, Christine was talking about, I've been talking about as it's discursive Taylorism, right? Now, I like, I like Taylorism that can eliminate inefficiencies. I like Taylorism that can... Um, better uh, free up a, a time, really, a lo like lower socially necessary time for creating things. Um, but that, uh, obviously not when that's privatized, the winds of it, but the discursive Taylorism, though, right, like that is, it, it is symptomatic. It's not just symptomatic, I think of the what left being... like just disciplining? When I say discursive Taylorism, I mean like discourse has been siloed into specific niches and then there are oh, speci there are specialists who have monopolies on the skill sets for talking about those things usually those skill sets are I did good in school and I have the right identity right and so identity politics is just discursive taylorism right so it, like it, I mean it's it, like a model of like research efficiency like uh, specialization yeah yeah mm -hmm. a symptom of a public education system that was erected to intentionally keep the working class divided and to de-skill most working people while hoarding skills and virtue for a subsection of mediators who are supposed to create class conciliation, right? Sure. I mean, I would say, because I know you had Daniel Tutt on earlier, and I know he's very anti-Nietzsche, but, you know, I will defend Nietzsche and uphold Nietzsche, you know, <laughs> that on the one hand, it is about that. It is about like um, making knowledge rarefied and inaccessible. On the other hand, I don't think that that's like its conscious intention or purpose. I think the unconscious intention, if you will, or the 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 real purpose, has to do with we don't know what this knowledge is for. We don't know what it's what its reason to exist is. So, you know, we don't know why we want to know what we want to know right That's, and yeah. you know there's a kind of a so there's a kind of an internal problem intellectually like why why are we doing this why do we want to know these things what is this knowledge production for what is this research for um, and then there's also a kind of an institutional logic which is the expansion of education and the qualification of, of educators and that you have to show that you are a knowledge producer in order to be able to be an educator, even though those are two very different things. Um, and so there's a funny way that higher education is now all justified on the basis of grad schooling, even though many people are never going to go to graduate school, right? And so the kind of liberal arts kind of education has been evacuated in favor of a kind of Everything is a kind of uh, professionalization and and a along the model of the professional researcher. And that's why I raise Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is like, okay, the search for truth has become an end in itself. The search for knowledge, really, data, facts, has become an end in itself without anyone being able to ask, why do we need this or want this? And what is its overall purpose in society? 
And, you know, it's like a Lukács kind of means ends reversal. There's a kind of reification of knowledge where knowledge becomes an end in itself as opposed to a means to an end, right? And so I would say that there's that problem, which is maybe a deeper problem, um, you know, which is not, not that, that, that doesn't mean that I'm against knowledge for its own sake. I'm not, right. right? But when you think about the institutional imperatives, it's not like people are studying things whose purpose may not be clear, but that are authentically interesting things. It's right. more where you're talking about a kind of endless subspecialization, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and again, justified, yes, justified in terms of identity politics, in terms of like, yeah, people staying in their cultural silos, I suppose. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a weird phenomenon to observe because I, I actually think it's a kind of a, more of a mysterious process, like how and why that took place. It's not like, okay, we're going to open higher education to the working class, but we're also going to exclude the working class from higher education. I don't think that it was intentional like that. I think it's played out that way, but I don't think that was, I think, you know, we live in a GI Bill higher education system expansion after World War II um, that we do have that, but also affected by the neoliberal era. Um, I, I think that and, the intentional yeah. aspect was in the 19... like between the 1905 and 1925. Like that's the period of intentional, progressive engineering of of this 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 thing oh that yeah we're you about. raised this did you raise this with christine woodrow wilson yeah saying we don't want to over educate the working class but you know i don't know that that prevailed in other words i do think the gi bill i think after world war ii i think it's different with like the fdr new deal kind of i think the intention there was a kind of you want a generally educated citizenry right there was a kind of a model of a liberal arts education that was going to be expanded to include the working class it's not um, quite that it's was, not quite that was like what they wanted at some level they wanted yeah. that. they weren't like oh this will prevent them from being manual laborers because the idea was that manual laborers still have to be citizens right and that was i mean i understand that just your average naive progressive at least has that going for yeah. them is that they do believe in education. The thing is, is that education has been gutted of almost any content right. and is this formalistic thing. And so most of what's made available through these kinds of endeavors, along with this lofty rhetoric of citizenship is really just like, oh, well, my education was shit, formalistic, contentless bullshit. And I, everyone else should be able to have access to that as well. well so that we can else, all be- You know what else happened, Dave, is that the boomer generation got a good education they did but then they became very cynical about it mm. and then they turned around and denied the people who came after them the education that they had received right they liquidated yeah. their own education and they called it western cultural imperialism they called it like patriarchy they called it heteronormativity like they just said all this stuff that we were educated in it's all shit, it's bad, it's worthless, it's worse than worthless, it's actually bad, um, nobody needs it, and it's like, well, you had it, and now you're going to deny it to us, who come after you. Mm -hmm. And they, they were successful. And I will also say that my generation, Gen X, are really completing the process. Like, the utter cynicism towards things of intellectual worth and value. Yeah, I'm a working class person, which means that I, didn't, I don't have this ruling class cynicism about the cultural heritage because that heritage didn't belong to my family, didn't belong mm. to me. You know, I had to fight my way to get access to it. You know, so it's all well and good for like rich kids to hate on the university and hate right. the museum. I'm like, the, as a working class person, this is the only place I can get it. I can only get it at the museum. I can, I can only right. get art at the museum. I can only get 
education at the university. I can't get it from, you know, my parents' friends, you know, and their cultural networks. I can't, I, I can't get it at home. I can only get it in the public sphere. And their attitude was very cynical towards, you know, their own education and the institutions that provided that education. And so they're just, you know, they're willing to burn it down because they had it. And so, you know, they're denying it to the working class. They are. Right. But again, like in this, that's more like the psychodrama aspect of it. Yeah. You know, um, I think institutionally that process has been more subtle and it has been about austerity and capitalism and streamlining, you know, cost cutting in one respect, but also allowing exorbitant costs in another respect, you know, and, and I just, you know, what I tell my students, because since you were talking about PC identity politics and mm -hmm. this kind of thing, you know, what are students really taught in college? What does a college degree mean? It doesn't mean what they're taught in their classes because nobody cares, right? What matters is that it helps you get a job. So it's a job market discrimination device. Right, right, right. And then what does an employer see when they see a college diploma? They see that you've jumped through some hoops, that you're capable of, like, disciplined task achievement. Right. But they also now know that you have been trained in PC multicultural identity politics, and therefore you're less likely to cause a lawsuit for them as an employee. Litigation culture. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that's why, you know, the schools are PC, because the corporations are PC. Right, right. And the corporations have to be PC because for no reason, they don't care. They just don't want to deal with the lawsuits. Which right. is why Norman Finkelstein will never get a job anywhere ever again. <laughs> well, right. I mean, so basically it comes down to this. If the corporation or the institution, like the university, like trains its employees in like PC identity politics, then that means if anything happens, it's the employee's fault, not the company's fault. Right, right. Because the employee did its due diligence it explain the rules to the employees and if the employees break the rules you can't sue us for that right we'll fire the employee but you can't sue us for that you can't sue us for the, what the employee did because we told the employee what they were supposed to do exactly and uh, you know that goes that, for me as a college professor right right in other words why do i have to sit through like sensitivity training videos or dei as they call it now training videos just so that they know that if I don't handle things the best possible way, that they can say it's not their fault, it's my fault as an employee. Right. That's all and, that it's about. And, and right? that, is, that is why the, the left to bread to uh, the podcast to YouTube influencer. So it's not social justice at all. Twitch, like it's it, understood. No, no. It, well, it, it's understood. This doesn't help anybody in the real world. This doesn't help people of color. It doesn't really no. help like working class women. It no. does not actually do anything, right? All that it does is immunize them against being accused of something. And the the current split between the dirt bags and the the woke scolds, the you know between thought slime and Vosh, between the serfs. Mexi, like all these Canadian personalities who have kind of dominated the, the sphere after Bernie, they, their arguments are arguments about affect first, like how many swear words do you use? But ultimately their arguments are always about, is this firing justified? Should this person be fired? Should this person, it's never uh, firing people on the basis of this shit is a really stupid strategy. No, it's always, well, should we hate J.K. Rowling or not? Should we hate uh, Dave Chappelle or not? Should we? It's always like it assumes that this this litigation culture, litigation averse culture, uh, is is right. It's that it's correct and that this is a way forward. You know, and litigation happy culture, right? Not only litigation averse, but litigation happy. 
Um, oh, fair enough. You know, it's just it's 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 a strange situation. So I think that the the intellectual situation we find ourselves in has many different roots to it. Um, it's not like a master plan. It's just this is how things tend to work out in a way that's convenient, right? And you know, it's an unfortunate circumstance. It really is. Because again, I feel like as a teacher, I want to reproduce my own learning experience. You know, I want to reproduce my own education. Um, because, you know, I think it's valuable, you know. Um, and so the fact that the institutions mitigate against it is really like so bad for me, you know, because it, it means that as one of my dissertation committee members said, he said, Chris, you're probably the last working class PhD student I'll ever have. <laughs> I think know? that's a, this is, this is like right now where I should probably say, okay, uh, Nance, if you're there, turn on your camera, microphone. We're going to check in on the chat. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the stream here. And we've got, uh, Basically, ten minutes here to close out, and uh, okay. So we didn't go through the syllabus, but it's okay. You can you can link it and let the, people the, see the massive amount of reading. And anyway, we're gonna have to work on paring it down to some highlights. We'll mm -hmm. pare it down and then have a syllabus day, you know, a proper uh -huh. one. For now, the syllabus was our disappearing mediator. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> In the Hegelian sense, yeah. So anyway, welcome, Nance. How's the chat going? It looks like everybody's happy. Everybody's content to listen um, and absorb rather than loft their own distractions. Um, cool. I think personally, I think I always come back to almost like a strange pessimism. Um, mm. And it's not because I think you're only offering that, but I, that's where I, I think I find myself. Um, and I don't want to be there, and I, I don't think that's what you're offering. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, so pessimism, I mean, yeah, I'll admit the last few years have been hard. And, you know, personally, I've been a little bit in a downbeat place. But, but I can still be summoned to the things I care about and, you know, what I think is worthwhile. And so in that sense, I haven't, like, given up and I'm not pessimistic. But, you know, we're in a dire situation. You know, the world is not, not going in a good way. And there are these problems. I mean, I would just say, um, yeah, we have to be sober about that. We have to be kind of, um, at least at some level, you know. Now, I don't want it to be overwhelmingly that way. But I do want to, and I want to be true to the moment too. I think that after, you know, a few years of Biden, after the midterm elections, I think that we can say, okay, you know, this progressive moment, right? The moment of now's our chance to like reverse neoliberalism, you know, help people out. Um, you know, because I, I was open to that possibility. I'm not like against expanding the welfare state you know, Medicare for all, this kind of stuff, the Bernie program, you know, uh, free college tuition, uh, you know, forgive student debt. I'm not against these things, of course. I didn't think they were really going to happen, but I also was not against them. But it, you know, this is just not the way things are going, right? And in the meantime, some other problems have shown up, like the COVID restrictions and the crazy crazy disciplining of the workforce between DEI and COVID. It's amazing. And, and of course the, um, we were talking about censorship, you know, like the internet ain't what it used to be. No, right? it's not. It ain't what it used to be in, in my time. You know, I remember when I got my first like commercial email address in like 1995 and it's just not, the same anymore right and now we are just being exploited mercilessly you know by these giant corporations that's what the internet is right and so you know just things are not great and things are pretty dark we talked about dark brandon like i don't believe in dark brandon as like a thing but 
he is. You know, the Biden administration is kind of dark <laughs> yeah. on a variety of levels, you know. And and we're not going to get any better with Kamala Harris and, you know, Ron DeSantis. You know, um, I mean, I don't know what to make of a second Trump presidency, which could happen. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what that means. I don't know if people go more berserk. You know, I don't know. You know, so the left doesn't seem like, you know, if it doesn't sort of like step back and say, okay, right, what are we doing? If they just stay on this merry-go-round, it's a dark place. It is a dark place. I think that's a perfect place to end is that's a that that unless yeah so like how about how about you say your goodbyes and then we'll uh we'll catch you <laughs> catch you on right now i look forward here. to talking with you again in the future both privately and publicly mm -hmm. um you know uh again i'll make the plug for the the books that are coming out from sublation on the this millennial era so the first volume is about the history of the millennial left through like a chronicle of articles that i wrote along the way across like 16 years from 2006 to last year 2022 and the second book is going to be more actually more like the um the way i try to teach marxism so it's going to be essays that i wrote that are really about trying to open up the history of marxism think about the ideas there and and you know get down to the basics um and you know so that people can consider its value um, and so that's going to be volume two coming out later this year. That's called Marxism and Politics: Essays on Critical Theory and the Party. Perfect. You know? So it's going to be um, that will be interesting. And uh, you know, I would say you know for those int interested in Platypus, you know, we do have an open door policy with respect to the reading groups we organize and the campus chapters that we have, and also um, articles to be published potentially in the platypus review um so uh yeah thanks for having me dave thanks a lot okay thank you for stopping by we really appreciate your support in this first year and we look forward to the syllabus conversation in the near future cool cool, cool. all right thanks take care all right peace And now, a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for watching all the way through. The fact that you made it to the end means you get a gold star. Hi, 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 yeah. What I'm going to do with this little bit of time remaining at the end is give you the quick rundown on everything. I'm uh, kind of assuming an audience of people who are not reading all the emails that I send out, who are not registered with Theory Underground, who are not taking ongoing courses at Theory Underground. And so you might be someone who's come to the channel for the first time, in which case you probably just think that this is a YouTube, in which case, well, of course, you're partially correct, but mostly wrong. Because if you look right here, what I have is a course site. It is its own platform on theory-underground.com, but it's not just courses. These courses are gateways to a bigger and more important conversation that is just getting started. And really, after this next month that I'm taking off to get married and to go on a honeymoon, once I get back, the conversation and the, the events really kick into gear. There's going to be a national tour that will have a sort of international component, not just because it's online, but also because we will be going into Canada, Mexico, as well as potentially Europe. So stay tuned. I mean, we've been invited to Hong Kong. We've been in, we, you know, there's talk about going to Thailand. Um, but it's kind of dependent on the people who reach out to us and talk to us because this is all word of mouth and DIY. I'm not doing marketing. I'm not really trying to pursue new clicks through the algorithm outside of basic cooperation kinds of projects that I do with people like Todd McGowan, Chris Catrone, Nina Power, Daniel Tut, etc. The point of doing what I'm doing with all of them is to say, yes, this is a part of a bigger conversation. This is 
you know, says beside everything going on with the the media left and theory tube and theorygram and all of those other things that are happening in the theory scene. But what I hope to establish through theory underground is a more rigorous and hybrid, um, sustained kind of dialogue with the people who are really serious about the life of the mind. And so, you know, that means not just watching videos here and there and then telling other people, oh, I've got opinions and then these videos say something about me, but instead drilling down into fundamental concepts, questions, problems, tracing out the contours and inherent constitutive contradictions of the fields that we are in. And so what I hope to see come out of the theory scene is an intellectual milieu, but this can't just happen overnight. It happens over time. And these courses are just to be a part of that unfolding. Most of these have already happened. So you know, Mikey teaches Zizek's For They Know Not What They Do. While he's teaching that course, I was simultaneously demonstrating how to be an active, critical, engaged student, right? And I did this exact same thing with the What is Sex course, where really it was Cadell Last from Philosophy Portal who was heading up everything, but it was me who was kind of modeling that student. But I also have co-instructed some courses here, like the Professional Managerial Class Consciousness and Ideology course that I co-instructed with Elton L.K. of the Working Class Intelligentsia and the Dead Parrots Philosophical Society, Elton L.K., Great guy, love him. But, you know, there's, he's just one of these people who are in my organic intellectual milieu sort of network. And then the people that have come in through the virtual have an opportunity to ground out into that organic network by meeting up with us on tour. Um, a couple of other people in that organic network who are here from the very beginning, and I've done stuff with them f with a lot of other previous projects, was Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, who are co-instructors for the Idea of the University course right here, which was the first course launched at Theory Underground. But if you want to if you want to meet some of us, if you want to actually ground out in the organic network, if you want to actually break through the walls that, that kind of come with the, these media form and actually get the vibe, you'll want to meet us in real life, in real in, in person, and we are prioritizing the people who are reaching out to us and filling out the form for the Theory Underground US Tour 2023. And so if you go to the tab on the website, on the on the header called events, you go to the drop down for US Tour 2023, then you can fill out this form here and then there's a high likelihood that we'll try to do one of our events in person wherever you are at. And so we're trying to add only real people who are serious about meeting in real life because if you prefer to stay in the role of a consumer, uh, of someone who just kind of subscribes to content and, and clicks on it whenever you're just kind of distracted from whatever you're doing, that's totally fine. But if you're actually looking to get to like, I don't know, another level of discourse where it's not just we're talking at each other, but instead we are in a field and we actually have reference in that field that um, go beyond just idle chatter, then you'll want to get involved with this for sure. So that's the main thing. I wanted to tell you that once I come back from the honeymoon and the time away for the wedding, the events are really going to kick off. The tour is going to be what I'm focusing most of my energy on. But at the same time that the tour launches, so Two will two books be published from Theory Underground. Uh, one is my book, Time Energy, and the other book is Underground Theory. There will be big names such as Slavoj Žižek, Norman Finkelstein, Todd McGowan, Elenka Zupancic, as well as Nina Power, Daniel Tut, Chris Catrone, uh, and a lot of nobodies like me. Just people who have either dropped out of the university system or are never even enrolled who are nonetheless passionate about studying theory as a way of life. That's what this book is. It's 31 contributors towards underground theory as well as critical media theory, ideology critique, the left and its critique, and there's even some essays in there on historical interpretation and the history of philosophy. So these two books... Uh, the Underground Theory book, as well as my Time Energy book, will be published and available September 1st. And that's basically when we kick off the tour. So 
If you want us to come to a city near you and talk about these books or do any kind of an event, um, then reach out, fill out the form. And uh, as far as time energy goes, you can see right here, I've actually got the time energy course is now listed. This course is going to begin in September. So if you've been interested in the concept of time energy, if you're interested in a deep dive through the history of philosophy, drawing from philosophers as ancient as Aristotle through to more modern metaphysicians of time like Bernstein or Kant, then this is definitely for you. But if you're even more interested in abstract time and domination through someone like Moish Bastogne, a sort of post-Marxist, or actually Marx, Bordeaux, Foucault, we could talk about disciplinary time, existential time. We're going to bring in Ordorno. We're going to bring in Nietzsche, Berendt. Um, this course is going to be going through the history of philosophy, mostly focusing on time, but also leisure and freedom as fundamental concepts and developing time energy as a sort of imminent critique of many of these philosophers and many of these theorists and of pretty much the entire political scene as it currently exists. And so this will not be a super intensive course. You're not going to be assigned entire books to read. Um, there will just be a monthly lecture uh, sort of seminar lecture, as well as uh, a monthly check-in kind of uh, discussion group, right? And that discussion group is one that's going to happen very much like the critical media theory uh, reflection uh, cohort discussion group that's currently also ongoing. So um, if you are not already signed up with the critical media theory uh, research cohort, um, then you'll definitely want to uh, get signed up with this time energy research cohort because it's going to be arguably as good or better than the critical media theory one. But both of these courses are not too intensive. Both are ongoing and it's never too late to join the critical media theory one either, right? I've, we've already gotten a bunch of signups two months after the fact, because this isn't something that will just end in six months. We're going to repeat it. And for the people who join late, they actually get to be in the next one as well. Um, so get involved with the time energy course and the critical media theory course. Same thing goes with the being in time course. We're reading all the way through Martin Heidegger's being in time as one of the most profound, difficult, and important uh, deconstructions and critiques of everything that we take to heart, that we presuppose just taking for granted as natural, uh, as subjects of modernity. This is what we do. Um, and Heidegger is one of the greatest enemies of modernity, as is obviously Friedrich Nietzsche. And so both of them are the kinds of frenemies of any serious thinker who's trying to interrogate uh, their own most closely held presuppositions, right? And so if, you if you've ever thought about taking on a challenge like reading Being in Time all the way through, um, then it's not too late. You can actually still enroll in this course and you can do the reading on your own for Division One over this next month. And then once you're caught up and you've gone through the lectures for Division One, Division Two will actually begin once I get back in mid-August, okay? So there's a tour, there's books, there's courses. What more could I possibly add? There's an app. And that's been something that has taken a lot of my energy and effort away from uh, Theory Underground as a website. It's because I've been mostly problem solving the app for the last few months. Um, but what I am currently showing up on the screen here are tickets. Every time there's an error with the website or my app, I have to open a support ticket with someone who's responsible down the line for figuring out how to problem solve the bugs. And so I've got, I've opened a million tickets. As you can see on the screen, these are tickets that I opened between uh, basically mid-July and the beginning of May. But then I can go back and I'm just showing you on the screen all of these different tickets um, almost as a way of showing off that I've been doing constant troubleshooting in the background because I'm on the fly learning how to operate and run not just like the sort of ins and outs of a course based or course gated social media site, but more importantly that I'm building the actual platform and then I'm doing it um, 
where I have to troubleshoot everything with uh, a programmers, a team of programmers. Um, and it's all good preparation for what I hope will happen as Siri Underground gets a little bit more steam over the course of the next year. Uh, eventually, I'll have a dedicated team of programmers, not people who are like these people divided between a million different uh, tickets that they are uh, problem solving, but instead having my own dedicated team. Anyway, so the app, you know, right now all I'm showing you is that there's a lot of t uh, support tickets opened, but we've actually reached a point now where I think that the app is about to go out. And if you're curious about that, just know that it's going to have like the capabilities for you to be able to message people who are on Theory Underground, for you to be able to partake in the forums and social groups. Uh, the social groups, including the multilingualism language learning uh, clubs, as well as the film club. Um, but more importantly, um, it will be a way to subscribe uh, on a monthly basis so that you have access to everything going on at Theory Underground. Not just all the courses, not just all the conversations, but also all of these B-side specials that we've been doing. These are not listed on the regular website. They're not listed on the YouTube channel. They're specifically reserved for people who are subscribers, who are really plugged into the kind of ongoing conversation. And so if you're curious about that ongoing conversation, just know that there are Theory Underground hub events. That's kind of what we're calling them for right now. But basically the hub events are like this one coming up here. Like right here, as you can see, um, there was a hub event on July 11th. There's, a, there's another hub event coming up on July 18th. And as you can see, there's an office hours event that happens during the hub event. But more importantly, um, there's a panel of presentations on hardcore theory, a panel of presentations on hip hop, uh, as well as a special segment on critical media theory reflections, where even if you're not in that course, you still get to kind of partake in one of the things that's going on with that course. Um, and uh, these kind of hub events where it's like one Zoom call for the whole event, it's going to be like six or seven hours long with different segments on different things, are really just an opportunity for people who are fellow travelers to drop in, to say hello, to kind of get the vibe, to see what's going on. And most importantly, for people who are uh, in ongoing courses or in past courses um, who have questions about the text, have questions about the lectures, uh, who have reading reflections that they've done on that week's reading, um, who want to talk about it, to be able to come to the office hours because every hub events will every hub event will always have an office hour segment where basically the students in currently ongoing or past courses have priority, meaning that if you take this professional managerial class consciousness and ideology course or this the idea of the university course or this you know for they know not what they know you know for they know not what they do course any of these past courses that you take uh you've got weekly questions as you go through it you'll always have someone to come talk to during the office hour events that are happening at the theory underground hub on a weekly basis so I just really want to stress that because otherwise you might feel like, oh, I'm left behind. These courses are already in the past. They're already over. There's nothing I can do. Uh, I just have to binge it on my own and I'd be all on my own. No, 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 no. Not only is there a live ongoing office hours kind of event where you can come and discuss what you're doing, but more importantly, there's also the forums. And so a lot of the video conversations we have related to these specific courses, those videos get uploaded into the forums on those specific topics, and then you're looped in. And the people who have taken those courses in the past, they're reminded about the content of those courses, and maybe they want to go back over some of the stuff, and it kind of keeps the discourse centered around the subject matter instead of just all of us talking, acting like, oh, well, we know what we're talking about. We know what we know. We know without even having gone through the same readings together. We just know that we all kind of know. We get it. We get it. No, this is what Heidegger calls idle chatter. This kind of communication that tends to happen online is symptomatic of what happens when all of the connections that we form are in these virtual networks that don't ever ground out in real life uh, discourse. 
There's something about real life discourse with voices and faces and the actual kinds of uh, non-perceivable pre-conscious things that occur in person um, that a lot of us are very removed from. And part of what I'm doing with Theory Underground is attempting to bring together my organic network with the virtual network. And so if you belong to the virtual network and you want to ground out in my organic network and actually get to know me um, and people that I'm fellow travelers with like uh, Ann Snellgrove or Brian Weeks or Elton LK of the Worker Class Intelligentsia, people that I have co-instructed courses with um, that I have as sort of connections in real life, you know what I mean? Um, it's going to be these events that are on tour uh, that are your best way of actually grounding out from the virtual into uh, what I'm calling real life relationships, right? Uh, and so hybridity between IRL and fully consumer algorithmically enticed online, you know, uh, whatever the hell we're doing on here. Ultimately, what I've built here with the app and the website, as well as the publishing arm of all of it, is an opportunity for people to be in an ongoing lecture, research, and publishing cohort uh, and to be able to ground out in something more real than just the, you know, whatever you get from the algorithm and that that provides the conditions of possibility to go from just being a part of the theory scene where it's influencers on platforms talking to fans or whatever to instead become a fellow traveler in an actual intellectual milieu where whatever you put into it, you'll get back a hundredfold. That's what I'm trying to lay the groundwork for here is the sort of antidote to so many of my frustrations at the university or trying to organize outside of university or just trying to be some kind of a YouTuber or whatever. No, so much more important is what's coming from this tour, from this app, from these courses. And so if you're watching this, if you're thinking about getting involved, there's no time like the present because really it's people's involvement in the first couple of years that makes all the difference. I understand that the longer these PSAs and the more unpolished or underproduced or less frequently published uh, this YouTube channel actually is, the lower engagement is going to be. The algorithms will continuously neglect, right? But it is the people who watch all the way through and to the end who are already pretty serious and they're looking to potentially get more involved and that's who I care about. And the channel can ultimately wither away and die because what's coming from my own platform and from my own medium is something that is capable of something so much more than anything anyone's ever imagined could come out of the internet. And uh, yeah, the Time Energy book and the Time Energy course are coming very soon. And a lot of people have been excited about that and have been wanting more on that. And so if you are one of those people who's excited about it, register soon. Go to theory-underground.com. Go to the Time Energy course, register for it. There's four tiers of involvement. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, those who do will separate themselves from those who do not. And uh, it's the doers ultimately that are going to make the difference. So I hope you're one of them and I'll see you on the other side. Take care. Peace.